Um, so I'm going to get this started, and we'll probably have some time for war stories if you, uh, if you all feel like it, if you don't leave me for a happy hour. Um, so my name is Lisa, and I am the VP of Service Reliability Engineering for Fastly. I started about um, 20 years ago. <sighs> Just had my birthday. Um, working in tech, uh, started out in the systems administration route with ISPs, kind of moved on. You know, it used to be called um, ops, then it was tech ops. I did database administration leadership. Worked for a company called LiveJournal, uh, where MimcacheD was developed, so you're welcome, internet. Um, and then from there, I went on, worked for other social media sites, worked for Six Apart, which, work, uh, which had type pad and movable type, and uh, eventually went on to uh, Twitter, where my job was to kill the fail whale. So if you don't know what the fail whale is, then I did my job. So that was cool. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Fastly, which is where I am now. I, we have a team of about um, 17 SREs. Um, and I'm going to be talking about how we run our incidents. If you don't know what Fastly is, we are, wait, hold on, our Edge Cloud Platform enhances web and mobile security and content delivery. So we're distributed, um, we basically make the web faster, Distribu distributed globally, over 10 terabit network capacity, over five continents. Um, chances are if you're online on a given day, you have hit one of our, you've hit our network at some point because we cache um, some of the world's largest websites or sites who are aspiring to be. So before I get started on why, on incident management and how we've approached it at Fastly, I'm going to take you through a story of something that happened to me over the holidays. I woke up on a plane to an image like this. And um, having been on call in an ops for 20 years, I can wake up pretty quickly uh, and get my thinking cap on. Um, so, you know, within seconds I was awake, made sure my shoes were on, and then basically thought to myself, wow, what an amazing opportunity to think about how incidents are, are managed. Um, because here we are in a plane that's supposed to get me to a destination, right? With the people uh, flying in the plane, people serving me drinks, um, you know, or trying to be nice to me, um, who sort of have to go from their regular job to incident responders. They're on a plane, there's not like a group of people sitting back there waiting for this scene to happen, right? Um, so how, so I, I was thinking like, this is amazing because not only do they get the plane to land, because I'm here today, um, but they also uh, made sure that I was calm, I felt safe. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't feel safe. I felt like I was about to die. But besides that, um, at the end of it, I felt like I was in safe, capable hands the whole time. Uh, in addition to thinking about what the people were doing on the flight, there was also a whole bunch of communication going on behind the scenes, because as we landed, we sped immediately to the gate, uh, so all the other planes, you know, had to be rerouted, um, and fire engine met us. Uh, so there is a whole variety of other incident um, kind of responders and processes happening within seconds. So not only did I leave alive, but I also left feeling very positive about Delta, my preferred airline, because I don't know what would have happened if this was on United. Um, so, the, thankfully, I don't have to deal with life and death situations in my job. Um, I do, however, have to deal with uh, managing all the types of incidents that you all do um, if, you're on, if you're working in tech. Um, we host folks like Twitter, New York Times, folks that need to have their data and their platform available constantly because while my job isn't about li life and death, those platforms are providing information that might be life or death, kind of critical information for people. Um, it can also be a platform for critical information like, for example, the election, um, where something can be changing minute to minute, second to second. 
when we kind of first looked at why it is that you'd want to have an incident management program, um, and I came in a year and a half ago, one of the first steps, and if you're looking at doing this yourself, is to think about what are all the ways that you anticipate that your service or a, a service dependency is going to fail. Don't be afraid to sit there and categorize them all, um, because chances are they will happen at some point, and that's the first step in understanding how to be that incident responder. So what's the goal of an incident uh, program? For us, it was around helping us with how we make decisions, which also should lead to reduced uh, time to repair, to make sure we're communicating internally and to our customers, and um, to make sure we're constantly improving for the next time. We decided to um, borrow from FEMA's incident management program, which again, much more critical for life and death situations, but also has a lot of parallels to the unexpected types of issues that we see on the internet. <coughs> so um, if you don't have this right now, uh, if you were to start out, these four basic areas would be the, the places to start with. Think about all, you've already categorized all the ways that you know things are gonna fail. Think about what that would mean to you and to your business and to your customers. What's the impact of that failure? Start from there. Determine what does that severity look like? Like how severe is it? And this is like a traditional term, right? From um, ITIL. I, you know, we're in like DevOps land and we try not to take too much of the traditional stuff with us, but there are some things that are useful. Um, so sev zeros through sev threes, pretty, uh, they give us like a, a, a vocabulary so we can all understand how are we supposed to respond right now? From that impact and the severity, you can set up roles and steps that you would take to, uh, to, um, to respond, and then define how you're gonna deal with it afterwards. So um, coming back to the idea of impact, like here's why we talk about impact, and by the way, that's like what I say every day. What's the impact to the customer? Our customers are, are, you know, our customers and our customers' customers are, you know, care about how does this impact them. I don't care whether or not you uh, understood the bug or not. I care about how the bug is impacting the customers. Um, without that, sometimes people, and maybe you have this in your own situations, if you don't have a knock or you don't have an ops team that is just sitting there waiting for this to happen all the time, it can be confusing for engineers to understand how much attention should I be paying to this? And sometimes you get executives who might be saying, I think this is the most important thing right now. But it may not actually, it might just be for some reason that person decided that they, that was the issue that they cared about today. You have to set yourself up with understanding things are gonna fail and how they're gonna fail and what that impact is. Otherwise you're in that sort of constant state when the smoke happened on the plane, to me that seemed very serious, but uh, the flight attendants had seen it before. They knew what to do, they knew, you know, we, we did still have to assume the emergency landing position. However, uh, that turns out to be a great way to keep a plane full of people um, from panicking and yelling. It gives them something to do. On the internet, we have, if everything is an incident, then then nothing's an incident. You just have chaos every day. So that's why it's really important. And I think if you're trying to launch this at your own company, it's really important to get your team and your uh, leadership to buy into this idea. So here's an example of how we define the severity levels at Fastly. Um, and the reason why we uh, take the time to indicate sub three versus a sub zero is you can learn as much from an incident that has smaller impact as you can from a larger uh, incident. Sometimes post-mortems and sort of urgency on issues are reserved for the really big issues. Um, but if you have more of the sev threes that go through a process, you'll actually find yourself with fewer sev ones. So in our case, we actually review our incidents, sev zero, one, two, three, every week. 
regardless of whether or not it impacted a large number of customers. Um, in the case, an example of like a big imp uh, incident uh, was the S3 outage. Did anyone go through that a couple months ago? Yeah. That one was gigantic, right, in terms of the impact to our customers. It had nothing to do with us, though. It didn't actually impact our own infrastructure. But we knew right away that our customers would be impacted and that we needed to have a response uh, right away. So we, ca we called an incident and um, treated it just as the same as if something had broke within our own infrastructure. Um, and as a result of the fact that we do this process so often, we posted a status update to our customers 40 minutes before Amazon updated their dashboard. Um, this slide is actually the core of my beliefs about how technology in our industry needs to change as we're thinking about incident management, which is that ultimately these are people and we have needs. We need to sleep and eat. We need time to ourselves so that we can be creative and think about how to avoid incidents in the future. The business has to keep running despite internet weather, right? But if you don't take the time to set up a process like this and establish things such as um, on-call schedules, then you may be requiring your engineers to be working implicitly or explicitly. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how to get engineers to be on call, but I think that's the number one issue, that's the number one question I get, which is like, how do you actually get people to answer their phones? How do you get people to get engaged? Because this is a 24 by seven business. And the answer is, um, well, you're nice to them, and you basically, over time, can make the case that if you don't wanna feel like guilty because you didn't answer your phone that one time, it's better to just call out what's real. Like who's actually gonna be the one that fixes this issue? Uh, are they the only person that's gonna fix the issue? If that's true, let's not have it be only one person. Um, but if, it's a, if that's true, why don't we just write it down? Why don't we just declare it and document it? That shows leadership, hey, we only have one person who's on call. We only have one person who knows how to fix this. And um, through that process, uh, especially if you can hire more people or figure out other ways to um, address the uh, single points of failure there, um, you will make yourself, uh, you will be taking better care of the people that work with you and for you. So Fastly doesn't have a knock, a traditional knock. Uh, once again, bucking the trend. Um, you know, ops, with the DevOps movement, a lot of companies are moving away from traditional knocks and they're moving away from traditional ops. Um, however, you still need to have problems, but you still need to have people who are paying attention and fixing stuff. So in our case, we have a global customer service engineering organization, and our SREs are also globally distributed. Um, so through that, we have basically around-the-clock coverage um, of customer tickets as well as our internal monitoring systems. We also have decentralized on-call and monitoring. So, there, for every service, for every project at Fastly, there is a, a team listed and an on-call schedule for that team. Um, what that means is at any point, anybody, a customer service engineer, an SRE, a network engineer, can reach out and page an appropriate team. And they're in, empowered to do so. Our customer service engineers are smart anyway. Um, and they can probably debug issues faster than a traditional knock could. Um, it also means that we save the time it takes. If in a traditional knock sense, it is often the case that it takes you longer to address an issue due to the fact that you have to go through those hops. So in this, in this method, um, and because engineers are sort of empowered to do their own monitoring, have their own on-call, we make sure that the right people get the alert um, uh, the fastest way. They also, all the engineers are included in our uh, post-mortem process and incident review. So if we're going through an incident review and we find that it took 10 hours for someone to um, respond to an alert, well, that's an opportunity for that engineering group to improve. And we encourage them to do that. So with this decentralized on-call, there's still the fact that 
there's got to be someone who's sort of calling the shots. So we do have a, share, a pager rotation that's a sort of a volunteer position for an incident commander, um, which is like a week rotation. And it's all people who have other jobs. So it's VPs, directors, managers, and they're in customer service, sales engineering, um, network engineering, SRE. They're all over the place. And the reason for that is we, because we believe that the diversity of people, of roles, acting as an incident commander gives us a different perspective. Um, so we learn more. When, the, when a customer service engineer is an IEC, we um, learn more about the customer's experience. When it's a network engineer, we learn a lot more about the network uh, with each incident. And as long as they stick with the process that we have, which is really about coordination and not about um, actually hacking on the keyboard, uh, the you know, we learn more. Um, so this is a person that, in order to be in that role, though, they do need to have uh, trust. Um, you, can't ha you can't hire someone and throw them in this role the next week. Um, they did try to do that with me, and it sucked. So uh, you know, it's good for them to know how your service runs. They need to be comfortable talking, like posting information for customers. They need to be comfortable talking to our executives and giving them a, high line, a highlight of um, how something's failed. This is another thing they can do. They can tell people what to do and when, and they can tell people to stop doing things, um, which is another question I get, which is like, how do you get engineers to stop making changes, uh, which we all know is the worst thing to do in the middle of an incident um, when it's not coordinated. And this person, because of the fact that they have the trust, they are able to just tell, uh, tell engineers to knock it off. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this one, but if you have questions, we can talk about it some more. This is actually just the actual process that we do. We see that there's a problem either because our customers notice, we notice, we always want to notice before our customers, but sometimes we get a ticket. We um, have internal monitoring, we have external monitoring, we have like a million monitoring systems, um, and those get escalated. We, everyone in the company is empowered to uh, page the incident commander. So if someone thinks that there could be like a sub three issue, they can page the incident commander. We immediately move into a communications channel, text-based communication channel, or sometimes a video bridge. Um, we actually mitigate the problem first. We uh, triage the patient. And at the same time, in parallel, we have got another track that's handling customer communication in a status post. That, you know, those three things right there, um, as I mentioned before, those three things are the things that we practice, I think, the most. And that is the reason why we're able to update our status uh, as quickly as we can, as quickly as we do, I should say. After we've mitigated the problem, the IEC's job is basically to say, this is actually over now. Let's move the other things. Because you know what happens. Like, you get all the people in the room, and they're all like, no, but you know what we should do? We should totally never rely on S3 for anything ever again. And then you get that, that conversation going, and it's, but everyone's like, but we're in the middle of an incident. Why are we talking about that right now? Or someone's like, let me know if you want me to you know, ping my friend at Google. And it gets very confusing. Our, ISC, our incident command process is like super transparent. Everyone in the company can watch as we're doing our incident response, and they do. And so we have to keep things sort of concise and not confusing. Um, so that IC's job is to say, OK, this is done. Let's move it on to other areas um, for communication. Again, they're making sure they clean up. Do we notify the executives? Do we have to have an FSA, which is our service advisory? Um, then we write the incident report, the timeline, the reason for the outage. We do the five whys until you just get to the point where you're like, I don't know, why is the internet? And then. Um, document it for a weekly review. And in the weekly review, we're basically going through and asking all the questions again that the person who wrote the incident report asked. So that's how much detail we're putting into each of our, each of our incidents. Um, and then, as I said, the continuous improvement. So each of those items are JIRA tickets, and we're following up on them, assigning them, and then reviewing them weekly to see, has anyone made progress on this? Do we really need to remove the S3 dependency? Those kinds of things are talked about weekly. 
Um, something that's, I think, unique to Fastly as well that we do is we involve everyone, not just the incident commanders, but we involve marketing, legal, HR, IT. Um, because we're so transparent in our IC, what it means is we find out things that, uh, you know, we wouldn't have otherwise known. We basically crowdsource our um, timeline in our service advisory. So maybe someone in marketing has something they would say a little differently in our FSA. We always are gearing for like transparency, but there might be a way that we can phrase it that won't be le as confusing for customers. Uh, it also means it takes the pressure off engineers for knowing how to do everything. Um, and I think they can answer for you. I think they appreciate being involved with the process. Um, one thing about this whole like transparent involve everyone thing is you will get a lot of volunteers in the company who want to help. And it's like the right, you know, you love it, like their heart is good, well-intentioned. Um, but it's not the right time for everyone to come in and give their opinion and offer to help. So there are ways that we train and we talk about how we can use these different people because we don't want to like, we don't want to like turn away offers of help. Um, so uh, do you remember the dying outage that happened last year? Anyone get hit with that? Yeah. I was the incident commander that day. And I mean, this is a story that's like on CNN front page, right? Like it's pretty, pretty big news. So of course everyone in the company wanted to be involved, like every engineer or like half engineers. So um, in that case, uh, I actually, once we had the core group of people working on our own mitigation, I set up multiple video chats, multiple uh, work, you know, Slack channels, and basically uh, gave each group a leader and a job. Research what happens if Dyne never comes back again. Research, like, does anyone still remember, like, how many people here still remember Bind? I remember this a story I heard from one of our customers that um, they had moved everything to the cloud and no one knew how to use Bind anymore because they didn't have any, yeah, all just young cloud engineers. And um, they had to kind of rely on the one person in the corner who, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the Unix admin, yeah. Um, so uh, we had a group of people working on technology decisions and appointed times, would you see them? So what that meant was um, the core group could focus without a bunch of extra um, opinions. And also, we were already working on our plan, plan A's through, you know, G um, without, uh, without, you know, in, in parallel. So that's what I can suggest you do if you have too many people interested in helping you. Um, so I can't stress enough with the continuous improvement. Um, I already talked about this slide. I jumped ahead. And finally, as a part of this process, um, I like to say that every incident is practice for an incident, um, but it actually is good to um, regularly do exercises where you w walk through what you would do in the case of such, you know, whatever incident. So once a quarter, we get lunch and get a group of people around a big conference table and somebody, it's basically like a big game of D&D. Somebody comes up with like a scenario and we all have our characters and we basically walk through trying to figure out how to solve a problem um, and at the end and see if we can actually solve it. And then at the end kind of write up what our um, follow-ups would be if it was a real event and then actually do those as if uh, we really had that incident. We do onboarding for uh, new incident uh, commanders, which is a great way as well to show you what you do in practice, but which isn't obvious. So we just had a couple new incident commanders recently, and there were gaps. You know, there were there were areas where we things weren't as smooth as they were um, usually. That's not a problem. That's actually an opportunity for you to improve how you train. Like, be willing to have have it go a little less smoothly so that you can gain another incident commander or you can gain insight into your process, don't throw them out the window. I think that's really common um, in ops for us to decide that only three people 
know how to run an incident and therefore like fire everyone else. But that's that's not the best. That's not how we improve. That's not how you get to. That's not what DevOps is. Um, so yeah, uh, start with your basics. Take the time to um, be really honest with your company about what breaks. Do the thing where you're like, oh, well, I guess uh, we only have one copy of this data, or we have like thousands of copies of this data in the cloud. What would happen if that got um, compromised? Like, go through those questions if you have time. Otherwise, just go through it when it happens. Um, remember that your engineers are people and that you should be empowering them to deal with their workload. Like, they're not going to be. They're not going to do you any favors if they're overworked. They're going to quit because they can get another job in this industry. Um, or you're, you're not going to have awesome products because they're too busy um, working all night on boring, uninteresting incidents. Always be improving. And what that means is be comfortable with admitting what's not working and uh, partner with everyone who's a stakeholder. It's not your job alone to run to make sure that the internet never breaks. And let those incidents teach you about yourself and about your company. That is it for me. It's a short one. Does anyone have any questions or stories? Yeah, I have one quick question. <clears throat> You mentioned during an incident you have two teams, one mitigating and one sort of providing communications, customer facing. Um, how does the team communicating, customer facing, how are they informed at a level that they know how, what and how to communicate? Um, because I think what we run into sometimes is the people trying to fix the problem or being asked to provide details about the problem during the fixing. Yeah. Um, so. That's definitely super common. The role of the incident commander is to always understand the impact, which is essentially what gets, um, you know, what gets posted to customers, right? Like, if you ask an engineer and they're like, "Oh, there's a, you know, there's a there's a bug in, uh, in our cache." Uh, that's not a good example. That doesn't happen a lot. Um, this uh, network just dropped offline on the internet. Like, that's not something that we can tell customers because it doesn't make any, it's not relevant to them, basically. It's not that we couldn't tell them. Um, so the incident commander, it's their job, and this is why they kind of also have to be fairly technical. Like, they don't have to know how everything works, but they have to sort of understand what would the impact to a customer be if the net network engineer just told me that this transit provider dropped offline. Like, so um, it is the role of the incident commander to always know what is the current impact and then we have another team actually doing the communication. So the incident commander in our Slack channel, which is often where we uh, coordinate, would be posting that impact every few minutes, basically. Like, here's what's going on. Here's what we've done. Here, and then the other thing is we have the, um, when we post in status page, it, it automatically updates into the Slack channel that has the, the coordination. So it kind of helps people understand, like, what's the last thing we've told customers? Um, if we have customer engineers who are reaching out directly to a customer, like in, in a Slack channel or so in a support ticket, um, that customer support engineer's job is kind of to handle the communication with the customer and they know through their own training like how the CDN works basically. So that's another element. They're all fairly technical people who are handling customer um, coordination and communication. And yeah, it doesn't really work to ask an engineer every few minutes what the heck is going on. So I'm familiar with that. <laughs> Any other questions? Like, I can get into tools. I can get into like, how do you get people to agree to be on call? Um, that's a fun one. I can get into like, what if people just don't want to do this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the questions about the tools we use to help me remember, I'm going to go back to the process. Um, so monitoring wise, I'll start from that layer. Um, we have Nagios, 
ganglia, data dog, new relic, catch point, sumo logic, uh, uh, there's more. Oh, graphite, I'm just going to, the reason why I'm naming all those is because one of the things that's hard about tools is that everyone, especially with the DevOps land, people like to do their own tool. And it's difficult to have a coordinated view of the world when you have all those different tools. So um, we have guidelines on what sends people pages versus what um, is just informational. And um, so from a tools perspective, oh, and then of course we have dashboards for like the high level, um, the high level like critical path um, data that tells us about the health of the, the network. So there's that. Um, I mentioned Slack for coordination. We use PagerDuty for paging. Um, and uh, we also use a video um, conferencing tool for when we need to have like real-time chats that are more like trouble, like brainstorming. Um, one of the challenges with that one, and actually we're, we're tackling this right now, is how do you have some people only on Slack and some people on the video? Um, so we're, we're actually looking at changing that right now because we want to have that real-time ability to like troubleshoot and brainstorm. But what you need is to have a, a responder, like a transcriber, sorry, who's like writing all the decisions that get made in the video conference. So that's a job that we have as well. Um, JIRA is used to um, collect data about incidents. So when there's an issue, sev zero through three, um, a, a JIRA ticket gets created for like tracking purposes, but that does not kick off the, um, the process. Really the process is kicked off with a page and with the Slack channel. Um, we have the ability to page people through um, Slack as well, and we're adding that functionality now um, further. Um, we really do try to keep as much in one kind of room as possible. Um, we are exploring looking at tools like VictorOps to um, get the inc all the alerts and incident response in one like, web interface, basically. Um, they're a pretty good option. Uh, what else do we do? We use Wiki for, we write up our incident report in the Wiki. And what else do we do? We don't use email. Drives me crazy, but nobody uses email anymore. So all of the communication is really over Slack and um, Confluence, basically. Are there specific tools that you may want to know about? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a fair amount of like tooling I think that we could be introducing. For example. Um, multiple, uh, I think some companies do Slack channels per incident instead of there being one. Um, you guys do that? Yeah, I, I've, I've been curious about how that, what coordinates that. Like, in our case, we can just do ISC, you know, like, you know what's going on. So I guess what we've been thinking about doing is we have an ISC Slack channel, and that just links to, okay, go over here to this other Slack channel for this other incident with like a, some sort of standard naming scheme. Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that, though. <laughs> the ticket name has the channel. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, the good thing about the JIRA tickets, I think, even if you don't like JIRA, um, but I think they won, is that, uh, <clears throat> and I didn't talk about this, is the categorization. We categorize. Um, you know, if something was a capacity issue, a network issue, a vendor issue, um, we've categorized as much as possible, uh, which again goes back to sort of that used to be what people did back in the day. Um, because over time we can look at trends and say, okay, if uh, what percentage of our incidents over the last six months were related to a particular vendor issue, to a capacity issue, um, then we can kind of help see, like it, it tells us where to sort of invest our time in reliability. although we don't have as many data points as you might like statistically for that to be useful, which is a good thing. Any other questions? All right, you get more of your evening back. You can still hit up happy hour. 
Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any more questions. Always exciting to talk about incidents. Have a good night. Thank you.